My name is Linda Fitch and I'm your host for the She Heals Global Summit. This is an online virtual event bringing together an extraordinary group of women creating transformation, change, and healing in the world. Every woman is just graciously offering you tools, They're offering you tools, practices, wisdom on ways to change your life, both the internal, that place of spirit, from that place of your body, from the place of your soul. And I am just deeply thrilled coming all the way from Spain today, or France. Are you in France today? I am in France at this moment, but I come from Spain, yeah. <laughs> Dr. Anoa Fredico. Fredrico. So you have to say it three times for me, hun. So um, Anoa and I know each other from some business ventures. And when I met her and listened to her work, I was just deeply impressed with her passion for bringing healing to other people in a way that's totally unexpected and um, such an amazing story and an amazing woman. Um, let me read, I'm going to read her. Thank you for being here. Let me read your bio. <laughs> Thank you for your invitation, Linda. It's a pleasure yeah. for me to be here. So Dr. Ano is a pioneer in visual education and has helped thousands of people throughout Europe and Latin America improve their vision naturally without surgery or glasses through her groundbreaking program, See Again Clearly. She has taught the program live in five countries, Spain, France, Mexico, Argentina, and Costa Rica. And soon we'll be bringing it to North America as well. <laughs> Since 2016, her online course has reached thousands more in over 30 countries around the globe. A distinguished academic, she is currently a faculty professor at the University of Toulouse in France, has been visiting research professor at the universities in Barcelona, Mexico, Taiwan, La Paz, Bolivia, and the University of Oxford. She holds a double doctorate degree in sociology from universities in France and Spain. And I am just so thrilled that you are here on the She Heals Summit. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Linda. Thank you for inviting me and thank you especially for doing this summit because I am certain that you are sharing wonderful work from wonderful women for other wonderful women that want to uh, and need to use these tools and uh, it's wonderful that people of your quality take the time and the effort. I know it's a lot of work to put all of this together and to offer it to yeah for the healing of so many people. Thank you. I, I honor the work you do. Well, wow, just a pleasure. And Anoa really is it. I mean, her work typically right now is in Spanish. Mm -hmm. So she's going to actually convert her program over to English so that she can actually reach the message to you guys. So I am just thrilled that you are taking this leap of uh, providing in English. Thank you. Um, it's going to be a challenge because you can probably hear my accent. Spanish is my native language and well, I also teach uh, natural clear vision at the university in Toulouse in France for several, for many years now. Uh, yeah, and uh, bringing this program to the English speaking world is going to be a, an effort, but I think it's necessary because there's so many people who don't even know that it's possible to heal your vision naturally and that you don't have to choose only between wearing glasses all your life and having your vision get worse and worse or going through the the yeah the pain and the risks and the costs of uh, surgery that usually uh, lasts for several years, but after some time, in 58% of uh, the cases, according to um, the ophthalmologist department of the University of Helsinki, you go back to having poor vision again. So you need glasses again. So most people don't know this possibility exists, and I usually like to make this analogy. If you would like to lose weight and be thin, you can do several things. You can get surgery of course, and remove the fat. But if you don't improve your habits or you don't solve the underlying emotional issues that are behind the reasons why you gain fat, probably you're going to put the fat again after some time. You can also wear a corset that fakes that you are thin and that, well, it can, you can manage for a while and it looks as if you are thin, but you're really not. 
Uh, or you have the third way, and that is to eat properly and exercise and have a balanced life, and then you are naturally thin and you own it. You own, um, you own it in your own health, in your own balance. With eyesight, it's the same. You can get surgery, but if you have bad habits and you don't solve the underlying emotional issues that are behind the poor vision, you're probably going to get back to the same symptoms or other ones but they, they will come back. Or you can wear glasses and it fakes, it, it allows you to focus, but it fakes the real good vision. When you remove the glasses, you, well, you cannot see, so you're dependent on, on some crutches for the eyes. Or you can take the middle way and learn how to exercise your eyes, how to eat properly, how to work within your inner vision so that it reflects in your outer vision. And then you own your own vision. And not only do you own, um, the ability to see clearly, which is a very joyful and empowering uh, thing to be able to do. But because of the transformation that you have to go through to be able to see clearly, there are many other aspects of your life that are balanced. So it's actually a very deep and powerful work that we do here. And, and I love to share it in as many ways as possible with as many people as possible, because it's a very beautiful and joyful process. I, you know, I don't think I've ever, you know, I've had a girlfriend that has done some work with some other kind of self-healing stuff, uh -huh. worked with eyesight, and then mm -hmm. didn't work, but I've never heard of that, putting that together, that just in the same way, you got to do the internal work uh -huh. to have the eyesight, that it's just not about a quick fix. Yeah. Well, um, let's see, uh, if we talk about how uh, natural vision improvement um, has appeared on the planet. <laughs> Actually, I'm not the first one to work on it. Uh, the pioneer of natural vision improvement is an American ophthalmologist, actually. And he did his work, he published his work in 1920. That is, this year, it's the century of natural vision improvement. There's many of this information, much of this information that has been around already for 100 years. But most people still don't know, well, what happened? Uh, he, found, uh, he found out um, that there are several processes involved in uh, the act of focusing. Like most ophthalmologists only consider the work of the crystalline, which is a natural lens in the body that's flexible. And there are muscles, the ciliar muscles, when they um, relax and uh, contract, they have the ability to move the crystalline. It's as if uh, you were projecting uh, on a wall or on a screen, some PowerPoint, and you have the projector, you have this little wheel that you can, you can move and there's a lens that will go back and forth and that allows you to have a focused picture on the wall or on the screen. So that would be the crystalline. And Bates, uh, the name of this uh, pioneering ophthalmologist, um, William Horatius Bates, <laughs> with a Spanish accent. <laughs> so uh, um, he discovered that there's a second uh, focusing mechanism. The eyes are surrounded by muscles on the outside. Hmm? There's four muscles that keep uh, the eyeball in the skull. And then there's two muscles that surround the eyeball. Hmm? And when this, these muscles tense, uh, they either make the eye longer or shorter. Okay. And that is also a focusing mechanism. The analogy with the projector and the screen would be you put the projector closer to the screen or you put it further away. You can also improve the focusing of the image on the screen, right? When you put, do that. Everyone has had this experience nowadays. <laughs> so uh, these two mechanisms combine. And actually, um, when people are nearsighted, uh, ophthalmology says the eyeball is too long but we can understand that it's because the oblique muscles surrounding the eye are too tense and they're making it too long. Mm -hmm. You have to know that just one millimeter of difference of shapes causes four degrees, four dioptries, you call that like that, in the lenses, in the corrective lenses that you have to put. So even a slight, um, too much tension already causes a focusing problem. And the same with the other ones, the <laughs> The straight muscles, when they tense, they flatten the eye, and that causes uh, farsightedness. When the muscles in the, 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 the straight muscles are irregularly tense, that causes astigmatism. And when the ciliar muscles are too tense, that causes uh, presbyopia. That's, uh, well, the, the syndrome of my arm is too short. <laughs> when oh, right, people right, get right, right. yeah, and they yeah. need reading glasses. 
So all of these uh, main uh, symptoms in, for vision, these four problems are the problems that most of the population has. All of them are caused um, by an excess of tension in muscles in the eye. So if the cause is too much tension, what is the solution? Relaxation and movement. And this is what uh, William Bates brought uh, the idea, and not only the idea, not only the hypothesis, he worked with thousands of clients and he had really great success with them. He also was the first person to say that the most important part of the vision process are, is not dependent on the eyes, but on the brain. Mm. He was contemporary of um, the psychology of perception in uh, the 1920s in Germany with the Gestalt theory and all of that. So mm -hmm. I don't know to what extent they knew each other, but uh, both, um, both lines of research are contemporary. So Bates in any case said, well, seeing also depends on memory, depends on imagination. So there are also mental processes involved. And if there's mental tension, then the mental tension becomes muscular tension, tension in the muscles. And then you have all these problems that are created, all these refraction errors. Okay, so that's a first part that's extremely important. Then there's another part in 1958. There's a PhD <clears throat> by a doctor called Charles Kelly. And this, uh, this, um, this researcher, uh, he actually had healed himself from myopia, from nearsightedness, using the Bates method. But he was studying psychology and he had been acquainted with the theory of Wilhelm, of Wilhelm Reich, who was a, hetero, a heterodox psychoanalyst. And uh, so this, um, this heterodox psychoanalyst, Wilhelm Reich, uh, had the hypothesis that when you don't process your emotions to the full cycle of completion, these emotions get stored in your body as muscle tension. And he wondered, what if I put together Bates' theory with Kelly's theory and see if there's a correlation, if specific emotional tensions are related with specific muscle, muscle tension, thus specific eye symptoms, symptoms in vision. And he did the research in 1958 uh, and he found very precise correlations. It was so, well, he did his research in the new school of social sciences that's related with uh, the University of Columbia. So not a, not a, <laughs> not a, I mean, a prestigious university uh, with right. serious work, right? And he got the, the prize for the best uh, this research, um, PhD dissertation of the year. Uh, he published uh, his works. He went to congresses of psychology, of ophthalmology. He was on the New York Times, on, in the Time magazine. He went to the radio, he went to the television. So everyone was very excited about his research. And after that, nobody paid attention. I mean, it had zero impact on the way ophthalmologists approach the problem of um, poor vision. Right, nobody, I, nobody ever mentioned it to me. Nobody ever mentioned it beyond that year. I mean, it, yeah. it went to the trash. Um, like Bates, when he proposed his theory, what did the other ophthalmologists do? Well, they banned him from the ophthalmologist uh, association. Uh, their, their point of view is too, revolu uh, is too much of a revolution and it questions the status quo for many professionals. Right. So, uh, very interesting, but we'd rather put it to the trash than take it into account. <laughs> uh, and then the insurance company, like if you don't have to buy glasses every couple of years or buy your contacts or your surgery, then... Right. There's less people earning money if you can, uh, yeah, if you can solve the problem naturally with some exercises, with some, yeah, healthy habits and with some um, uh, emotional healthy habits too. So... Well, um, as I said, I didn't invent the wheel. Uh, must, a lot of the, of the research that I've put and synthesized into the program uh, is based on scientific work done by other people and actually in many different fields. I, I have uh, looked for information talk, um, um, supporting natural vision improvement in ophthalmology, in optometry, in um, neurophysiology, neurosciences, um, posturology, nutrition, um, psychology, anthropology, sociology, and history. At least 10 disciplines <clears throat> have findings, research findings that support the idea that there are um, 
causes to poor vision that we have something that we have an ability to impact on them thus there are solutions other than a glasses or surgery we can improve our posture we can live less stressed we can eat more healthy uh, we can um, have good habits being more often in nature like nowadays we spend too much time being inside indoors with artificial lights with screens and those bad habits beyond what i explained about emotions etc they also um, cause too much tension in the eyes and they cause poor vision so there's um there really is um, proof in different research and scientific um, results that supports and, and backs up uh what is in my program and then uh, maybe my my uh well what i have done <laughs> my specific yeah. work has been to look for all this research all over the place and um make a very step-by-step -step, uh, process that's easy to follow by anyone and translate those sometimes big theories and big terms into well daily language and so that everyone can understand what's going on and can apply it to their own life and improve their vision that's that's what i'm doing I know it's amazing. I just want all the listeners to know that this is a woman that also, besides the two doctors, also received, um, as you were talking about, one of them, Bates or somebody's, the award for your doctorate thesis for his thorough. So we know it's been well researched and that everything's in a package. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, mm -hmm. So where, where did you get, become passionate about eyesight? Well, um, actually, uh, I, have, I have my own personal story with it. Um, I was born um, half blind, like my brain didn't consider the information coming from one eye and cross-eyed, so I looked like this <laughs> when I was born and very nearsighted uh, of the other eye. And when I, saw, when I was six months old, uh, my parents called my grandfather, who was a medical doctor, and they asked if he had a good address of a good ophthalmologist that they could bring me to, uh, because it was very obvious that I had problems with my eyesight. And so at the time we were living in Barcelona and he advised some, of, some ophthalmologists, we went there, and I was very lucky because this lady uh, worked with natural vision improvement. She was aware of this line of research. And so she advised my parents to do some stimulations and some, well, to play a certain number of games with me. And by the time I was one year old, I had perfect vision. Everything was gone. No nearsighted, no, wow. uh, no uh, crossed eyes, and everything worked perfectly balanced. So I grew up. Uh, on the one hand, having a very strong identity of a person that sees very well from the far, from the near, by night, by day, with both eyes. And on the other hand, I heard all my life the story of how I was born with such poor vision and blah, 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 blah. Uh, actually, this was one story that my parents used to tell every, every birthday. So uh, it was one of my first experiences to know that it's possible to improve your vision naturally. But anyway, life goes on, <clears throat> and I studied, uh, well, I, I studied at the University of Sociology, and I participated in a um, mobility exchange program in Europe, so I went to France to spend some time during my studies, and one day I woke up, and I saw double, and very blurry, and honestly, I panicked. Uh, oh, yeah. The, the day before I saw perfectly and that morning I woke up and I saw very blurry and double. I called my, my mother in, in panic, in fear, and uh, she was even more afraid than I was. <laughs> like, don't call me to tell me this. I cannot do anything. I'm like a thousand kilometers from you. Go ahead and call an ophthalmologist. And I'm like, yeah, of course, <laughs> that's, a, that's a good idea. That's a good thing to do. So I picked up the yellow pages at the time. I didn't have any access to internet. Uh, so it was a long time ago. And I started looking for ophthalmologists. I, I was new in France, so I didn't know anybody that would recommend a good professional. So I started calling. And the first one that said that he could see me right away, I went directly, which was a very bad idea. You should never go to empty restaurants. If they are empty, <laughs> it's for a reason. Usually a they're not very good. <laughs> so anyway, I did go to this guy. And uh, I remember it was a terrible situation. It was cold. It was dark. Uh, it was in the winter. 
Um, there was little light in the space. He didn't even greet me. Uh, so I felt like I was a burden rather than a welcomed human being. And I told him how nervous I was because the day before I saw perfectly and now I saw very blurry and double. And I wanted to understand what had happened to me. The question went uh, in one ear and now the other one, he didn't care. The only thing he wanted was to put me in front of a machine with lenses and letters and numbers and for me to say when I saw them the best. And then he wrote in a paper so many degrees of myopia and so many degrees of astigmatism and he told me off to buy glasses and I'm like, but why did I see perfectly yesterday and today I don't? Silence, no answer. Go get your glasses, that's not my problem. And I remember that I was so furious and frustrated. Um, at the time I was too young but to do so, but what I really felt was to leave like slamming the door and not wanting to pay him and remember his ancestors, but I didn't do anything of that. <laughs> <laughs> I paid him and left politely. But the moment I went out the door, I was so angry that I crushed uh, the prescription, I threw it to the garbage, and I said to me, I won't wear glasses until or before I know what has happened. So I'm so happy that I had this such strong identity of someone who sees clear and that I hang on it. And so I went home and started calling my friends. I, I needed to let out all the frustration. <laughs> and then one of them was like, well, you know, um, I have this uh, doctor. He's not an ophthalmologist. He's a generalist, a uh, family doctor. Um, I don't promise that he will find a solution, but what I do promise is that he's going to care, he's going to look, and he's going to try to understand what's going on. I'm like, okay, I'm in for that. <laughs> I, that I feel good about. So I go to this other guy, and curiously enough, uh, the day after, it was a sunny day, I got the appointment during the day, he was very friendly and welcoming, and I'm telling all these things because they also play a role in how vision yeah. works, yeah? So the conditions were completely other and much more friendly. I go there and he, I, I tell him the story. He looks at me, he examines, uh, uh, he listens carefully, he examines me and he says, um, well, my dear, what you have is sinusitis. Sinusitis? I had sinuses. Exactly. So they're, they were inflammated. Yeah. Well, I, I got a cold or something and the sinuses were, inf yeah. were uh, voila. Uh, there was an inflammation there, there was an infection. So because of the inflammation of the sinuses, they're making pressure on the eyeball. And when the eyeball is deformed, there's an error or infraction. There's a problem with focusing. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah, so my scientific mind is satisfied now, my curious mind. Okay, so now you have to take seven days of antibiotics. And when the sinusitis is over, your vision will go back to normal. So I did take the antibiotics and indeed in seven days my vision was back to normal, back to perfect. And I remember having thought what would have happened if I had listened to the first guy and if I hadn't been so stubborn uh, to want to understand and so identified with my clear vision, maybe I would have worn glasses for the rest of my life. Right. Because when you get glasses, they tell you your eyes adapt to the glasses. Usually when, you, when your eyes are measured, uh, they give you a, a note with numbers of the prescription you have to get. You go to the uh, optometrist to buy the glasses and they look at the numbers and they say, we're going to give you glasses by measure. Come back in two weeks and you'll get your glasses. So you go there two weeks later. And you give them the paper uh, with the numbers inside. They don't measure again your, your uh, eyesight. And when they give you the new glasses made explicitly for you and you put them on, you're like, ah, I don't see anything. Are you sure they're my glasses? And then they look at the references between the paper and the glasses and they say, yes, yes, they're yours. Now your eyes have to get used to them. Right. There's a problem there. If you go to have your sh shoes that are handcrafted by measure, especially for your feet, and when you go get those shoes two weeks later, you put them on and they hurt everywhere, nobody would accept, now your feet have to be adjusted to the shoes, would they? No, it doesn't make any sense.
What happens between the time your eyes were measured and the time you get the glasses, the tensions in the muscles have changed. The tensions in the consciousness have changed. Your emotional tensions have changed. They're not gone completely because they, if they, they were completely gone, you would see clear again, but they may have um, decreased or they may have increased. In any case, they're different. But now to see clear, you have to look through glasses that keep your eyes always with the necessary tension to see clear through them. And the problem <clears throat> is that you have to keep the, mus the muscle tension, the emotional tension, and the mental tension. So your, eye, your glasses not only chronify the problem and keep you from being able to see with your own eyes, but they also chronify the mental and the emotional tension. Right. Anyway, I didn't know all of that at that time, but I remember having thought, okay, what if, I would have listened to the first guy <clears throat> and I would have worn glasses. Maybe I would use them all my life because people get used to their glasses. And I remember having thought a second thing, how many people may be out there that for some reason had tension, maybe because they were angry or maybe because they had sinusitis or maybe because of something else, but maybe it was something temporary. And if they got as freaked out as I got, and they called the first person that could see them immediately and stayed with the first uh, diagnose. Maybe they're still wearing glasses today. Or they were six years old or six. <clears throat> years old. Yeah, and they didn't need, yeah, exactly. So if they didn't take the time to understand the process or what have happened as I did, they're wearing glasses when there could have been another solution. But anyway, I thought that and I went on with my life. <clears throat> And, et voila. and then uh, many years, so that was, I was 22, 23, something like that. And then about 10 years later, I was 34. I was already a university professor in the University of Lille. And I was, um, <clears throat> I was a research guest at the University of Barcelona. And I was um, editing um, an issue, a special issue on, well, uh, of a journal called the International Sociology, so a prestigious scientific journal. And so I had to read lots of articles very quickly and I was in Barcelona, so I had to go on the subway and I noticed that I didn't see the articles well. I had to put them far away. And also in the subway, I couldn't read the names of the stations. And I thought, okay, I'm 34, this is weird. <laughs> I side problems again. But now I know I have done it twice. I have got back to my perfect vision twice. So maybe I can do it a third time. And maybe I can do it in a different way this time. Because the first time uh, my vision went back to normal um, through physical stimulation, relaxation and movement. The second time it was a chemical solution with antibiotics. And this third time I had actually been studying already uh, healing methods that studied the body-mind connection and how the symptoms that your body shows are messengers that want to reflect for you what emotional and mental, and mental tensions you have in your life. And when you see and you understand and you integrate the message of the symptom, the symptom can go away. Okay, so well, nowadays there's many approaches that work with these ideas. And I was studying some by them already four or five years. And I thought to myself, okay, maybe this time I could do it this way. And I gave myself two months to solve my outer vision problems through inner vision work <laughs> and to sort out whatever emotional or mental tensions were going on in my life. And I gave myself two months to solve it. I thought, okay, I take this time. If after two months I still have um, problems with my vision, well, then I'll go and get glasses or do something else. So I went to an ophthalmologist to get a, a diagnose but not to wear glasses, just to know, to have an indication, to see in my books what I had to work on, exactly. So, well, at that time I had developed um, presbyopia, which is, I mean, when I read that I was, I felt as if 20 years had fallen onto me because usually you get that when you're 40 or 50, and I was 34, <laughs> and I got astigmatism again. So I went to my book and, um, well, to tell the story quickly, what the story was, uh, well, my eyes were telling me, you are bored with your life and you have betrayed your values. Uh, okay, <laughs> so 
Wow. I know. So, <laughs> so I had to have a very serious talk with myself and see what I was doing to myself. And being very honest, I had to recognize that my eyes were showing me the truth. Um, I was being a professor at the university because that was my father's dream. That's what he would have liked to do and never managed to do. So I was being the, the good girl, <laughs> very obedient. Uh, you know, all this, um, uh, yeah. well, anyway, the, the, the loyalties in families and these things. So anyway, and I had to recognize that that was not was what made my heart sing. What I really love doing is therapy, healing, coaching. I mean, participating in a way or another, the transformation of the well-being of other human beings. That's what makes my heart sing. So, um, yeah, so, okay, I had to recognize what my eyes were reflecting. Isn't and that, I, mean, I know that's just amazing because that is a very common story uh -huh. of, you know, like I'm doing my primo thing at age 25 and I'm not happy or age 30 and I'm not happy. Age 34, I'm not happy. Uh -huh. Well, I, I am happy that this message came through uh, just refraction symptoms. For other people, sometimes it comes through cancer or near-death experiences or things that are much, 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 much harder. So anyway, uh, my eyes were reflecting. I know, actually, you're not happy with your job. You're not happy with your life. You should do something about it <laughs> and preferably do it quickly to see clear again. So I did take a series of uh, decisions and reoriented myself um, uh, and um, yeah, went more into the um, therapy and holistic healing um, centers of interest and reoriented my research in that direction. And then my uh, eyesight went back to perfect once again. And now it's uh, many years later and I see much, much better than at that time or the 10 years ago because, well, my, my vision is reflecting that there is ever more clarity in my life. But anyway, so at that time I, I, I tell myself, okay, I have healed my vision three times in three different ways, like working at different levels. Maybe there are other levels. So there's the physical, there's the chemical, there's the emotional, maybe there, there's other, other ways to do it. And uh, they're not exclusive, but complementary to each other. And I started uh, looking for other evidence and I have found other levels of uh, vision improvement. You can improve your vision at the mental level, because as we said, the main organ of your vision is your brain, not your eyes. So even if your eyes didn't improve, which they do, uh, you could still improve your vision, your experience of seeing by working with optimizing how the, the, the mind and the brain handle the information. You can also improve your vision by working with light and energy. I, uh, I mean, vision is a process that requires light. We don't see in the dark. So, but as we said, our re, uh, relationship with light has changed a lot. We don't spend as much time in the sunlight anymore and we're always indoors with artificial lights that alter uh, completely our relationship to light so i teach people how to <laughs> how to go back to a healthier relationship with light and once we talk about light we can start talking about energy nowadays there's more and more people that are aware that there are healing techniques activating energy for example in your hands like with reiki or ireka or uh, body mirror anyway there's many techniques nowadays and you can use um, that energy also to um, accelerate and enhance, enhance the healing processes of your eyes and your vision and once we go to talking about energy it's easier to talk about more subtle uh, things like at some point in time in my program, I teach people how to see auras. That's a part of our visual experience. Actually, it's the first ex experience of seeing that we have when we are babies before the macula is linked um, through the nervous system to the brain. We first see with our peripheral, peripheral vision and we are able to see auras. But this kind of perception is decouraged by society. If a six-year-old boy says, oh, mom, how orange are you this morning? probably they're going to bring him to the ophthalmologist if they don't bring him directly to the psychiatrist. So it's not encouraged to uh, share our perceptions of auras, but rather the opposite. 
But if you remember how to do it, if you are given the a procedure, the technique, it's very easy and everyone can do it. And that opens two things. On the one hand, the way you have you, to use your eyes to see auras is the best way to use your eyes to see well in general. That's the first one. And the second is that, um, well, it opens to other dimensions of our vision and our being. And it becomes more and more clear that the way we see the world depends more on who we are than what the world is. That is, outer vision is very deeply connected to inner vision. And then we can use our vision as a metaphor in a way that, again, the way we see outside allows us to see how we are inside. And then is when this saying that the eyes are the windows to the soul becomes more and more tangible. <laughs> and then you can start using your eyes and your vision as a GPS to uh, orient in life and to be happier and also to be healthier. You start noticing that there's places that you see better and places that you see worse. Activities that when you do them, you see better and when you do them, others, you see worse. Or people that when you are with them, you see better. Other people when you are with them, you see worse. Or certain emotions, when you have them, you see better and other emotions, when you have them, you see worse. Thoughts that when you have them, you see better, when you, others than when you have them, you see worse. And also places where you see more light and places that you see darker. And all of those are indications of what's the direction, what's, what's the path of happiness and health for you. So you can use your, your eyes then to orient in life and reality. And um, so we go to the, from the, uh, how to say, from the more dense physical to the more subtle uh, with vision and then we balance uh, both both eyes that they both work as well and that they both work coordinated so that people have 3D vision and when you balance uh, the way you see with both eyes when you coordinate them you're actually also coordinating your hemispheres your brain hemispheres so that helps uh, for people to access to all of their forms of intelligence because as you know uh, each uh, hemisphere thinks in a very different way. The one thinks in sequence, the other in parallel. The one is rational and the other is intuitive. The one is analytical and the other one is uh, yeah, intuitive. Um, uh, the one is, uh, thinks of time like before, now, after, and the other one thinks in terms of synchronicity. The one cause effect and the other one causality and so on and so on. So, um, and most people um, live using al almost just one of those kinds of uh, intelligence, but not both and not both at the same time. Our schooling system reinforces the rational one and tends to think that imagination and intuition is nonsense, which is very, uh, it's a pity not to say it's stupid because it's like throwing to the trash half of our intelligence, right. yeah? Why don't we use both? Like we have two eyes or two hands, why should we just use one of them? So when you balance um, the use of both of your eyes, it coordinates better your hemispheres. The callus corpse works better between the hemispheres. So both, of, both types of intelligence are more accessible to the person also to orient better in her life or his life. And that balances also both of the parts of the body. They're more coordinated as well. As well. And that balances as well both facets of personality, masculine and feminine. It yin yangs people more. So it's actually a very, very, very deep work that we do through improving vision. Actually, many people say, I know I came because I wanted to see better. And when I see it, at all the transformation that your program has caused, I'm in complete awe and admiration. I didn't expect so much. And actually, seeing better is just the cherry on the top of the cake. And the most important thing is what happened. Uh, to get there and everything that's changed. So, <clears throat> well, in a nutshell, that, that is the work I do nowadays. <clears throat> I am awestruck just <laughs> because it is like, it is just the, that little nut on the piece of the cake, you know, versus everything else that comes into balance and alignment with your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so I have people that after taking my course, they have changed careers or they have moved somewhere else or they have made re their family life becomes better or their 
relationship with their spouse becomes better or they decide that it's time to take paths apart. But often there's other life transformations that come with improving the vision because of all the work that you have to do to, to get the result. And so it's like the vision is the carrot that, <laughs> that gives you the motivation. <laughs> but then, yeah, the important thing in a way is elsewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. To do the deep work with it. Exactly. So, um, gosh, your website was saying that you've already brought this message to over 185,000 people. Yes, and probably more. I think that's, that doesn't include the, the dates, the, the numbers of my last lunch that we just uh, finished last Thursday. So maybe nowadays it's twice or something. I have to update it. But anyway, yeah, the internet is a blessing. It's so wonderful to be able to share with so many people with these amazing tools nowadays. And uh, yeah, there's people following me from 87 countries at this moment. And uh, yeah, now I have students in 40 countries, over 1,200 students, something like that. So yeah, it's growing and growing and it's a, it's a pleasure to share it. Wow, and you're gonna go, you're gonna put it in um, English. Exactly. Yes. So. Yeah, so I have been teaching it in Spanish uh, offline for many, many years, online since 2016. Uh, I did it in French at the university in Toulouse um, and uh, I just came back from uh, another workshop in Los Angeles. I, I just came back home today so I'm, my body is in the same time zone as yours, <laughs> not the rest of the city but I am. And uh, yeah, I mean seeing the response of people when we were together in, the, in Jeff Walker's universe and seeing the response of the people in LA in this workshop that I went to, it's like I cannot keep this information from the English speaking uh, people. I have to make the effort to put it available and, and to be of service to more people because there, there were so many people interested and they had never heard it was possible. Uh, one or two had heard about Bates or Aldous Huxley, that ha they had books about this, but the, 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 the great majority had ne never heard about it and didn't even think it was possible. So yeah, we are on duty. I think we have to do this. I say we because I know you're also doing amazing work and undoubtedly all the ladies that are talking these days. So yes, yes, thank you for uh, opening this platform because actually thanks to you it's the first time that I'm talking about this in English in a more extensive uh, <laughs> way and it's the first time that I'm going to offer uh, to people to yeah opt in to my list and have uh, uh, a little gift with some techniques and something to learn so they can start improving their vision naturally and 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 see that it's tangible that it works so if there's people interested probably will sort out for a link to be there somewhere so they can get this uh, information right yeah and I know I already talked about if you're Spanish speaking you're just ahead of the game because you have a class coming up in April April yeah uh -huh. and and before every class I always offer free classes so people people can understand have an, a deeper understanding of the process that they can test several techniques they can start improving their vision there's actually people that with the free techniques I teach, they already solve the problem and they ditch their glasses and they don't need them anymore and they're already happy. And for those that need more help and want me to take them by the hand through the whole process, then yeah, we work through, through it all um, during six weeks. And yes, the, the opportunity will be available in April and maybe you can put someplace the web page or well, we'll arrange something yeah, we'll, about we'll, this. We'll put yeah. it on here for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, the link for it. So, um, Gosh, what lucky students you have that are those, you know, 18 to 21 year olds or whatever that are learning and being able to shift their life right now. Yes, uh, really um, owning your own vision, the sooner you can do it, uh, the better. It's a gift for life. Uh, my dream would be, and I'm working on it as well, uh, to have this information be uh, taught in public schools, in schools when, when children are are small so as they learn how to read and write that they learn or how to bike or how to play sports if they learn how to use their eyes properly then they have good eyesight good vision for the rest of their life um, i'm um, i'm having some contacts with some schools in uh, mexico uh, so i'm going to go teach 
there in person to the kids. Uh, uh, there's some colleagues doing it because I, I'm not the only one. I'm in a network of, there's a Spanish association of visual educators. We are like 40, which means we have over 1 million of Spanish people for each of us. <laughs> and uh, yeah, like um, what? 50 million of Spanish speaking people for each of us. <laughs> yeah, this profession is very small and the need is huge. One third of the population has problems with vision. So we really have to get going and start teaching it in schools and offering online programs. And we have to spread this information so that people that want can, can learn how to do it. Yeah. Are you getting pushback from the professionals that like the ophthalmologist and those kind of things? Are there well, um, the interesting thing is that the first time I started with, um, with uh, the methodology of teaching it online, like the first time I, I started doing it, there was a lot of resistance. There were many ophthalmologists and optometrists writing to say, this is nonsense, it's a hoax, it's fake news, they're trying to get your money and it doesn't work. And uh, so there was a lot of it in the beginning. And, uh, and then it calmed down. And actually I have students, many of my students are people that come from health professions like nurses, doctors, um, uh, physiotherapists. And I also have a handful of ophthalmologists and optometrists that are learning uh, from me natural vision improvement. And they truly honest about wanting to help their clients and give them options. And actually, I think that's the, that's the most honest thing to do, to inform people, to let them know how things work and then let them choose Anyway, there's going to be people who prefer to wear glasses. Okay, they're free to do so. And there's also people who prefer to get surgery. Well, if they have the information, they're free to decide whatever they want to do with their body and their life. But the people that want to learn how to use their eyes properly and to own their own vision, they should know that the um, possibility is there. And uh, this is what my work is about, giving those people the option to do so. Well, and I should say that internal work that's required, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's sometimes it may be easier just to wear the darn glasses and not ever address those deeper <laughs> issues, you know? Yeah. No freedom, no freedom but um, yeah. Yeah, the, doing it the natural way, it requires engagement. It requires to spend some time and effort and attention during a period of time to engage with your own health and to become responsible of your own life. And there's people who are willing to do it. And then there are the tools. And I am very glad to help them out and, uh, during that time. And there's people that won't ever be interested in that. And that's fine. But at least let's give everyone the information so that they can choose whatever they like to do. Uh, and you were saying, I heard you say that, um, at one of the presentations that... Yeah part of the money actually goes towards a non-for-profit where you're helping kids. Exactly. So this is something that I decided on my last birthday and uh, it's an ongoing process. Um, I, have to, I, I have started conversations with people in Kenya and with people in Mexico. My idea is that for every adult who registers to the online program, uh, I want for a child coming from poverty to be able to see clear without glasses or surgery. Why? Because um, in the poor communities, and if I think of the Spanish speaking world, there's like 80 million of children living in poor conditions. Yeah. And in, this, in these places, um, well, even if children go to school, which they don't always do when, the, when it's very poor, but even if they, want to if they go to school, if they don't see well, they cannot learn. And in these communities, often they don't have the money even to buy glasses. Or if they did have the money, they wouldn't buy them and wear them because nobody wears glasses and they don't want to be bullied and to be the weird one. Right. So um, anyway, there's a better solution than wearing glasses. So what I want to do is make sure that I go to these places or that I train people there or others to go with me so that we can teach these children uh, to see well so that they can grow healthy and move freely and learn easily and they have chances to thrive because then they can learn. So yeah, this is the nonprofit 
facet of my work. And as I say, it's in progress, but I think this summer will be the first time that I will finally get to do it. So I'm very happy about it, very excited. I will start in Mexico, probably. Mexico has had a very special role in my life. Uh, and uh, so it's an honor to, to be able to give back after all, all that I received uh, from Mexico some years ago. <laughs> And it sounds like then, it, like the next step is then teaching trainers. Exactly. That's also yeah. happening this year. Uh, lots of plans for 2020, but it's the, um, the 100th anniversary of natural vision improvement. So it's the year to, to really grow to the next level. So this year I'm starting um, a certification for uh, visual uh, facilitators, natural vision uh, yeah, I'll have to find a nice name in Spanish and English, but <laughs> in Spanish, we call them visual educators. Okay. Uh, maybe in English, it would be visual coaches anyway. But uh, yeah, to train people so that they can also do the work with, uh, with the people that are interested. And that there's uh, the, the, the impact is multiplied by many times every time there's a new visual educator. So yeah working in English, trans translating the program in English and starting a school of visual educators. Those are the two big projects of this year for me. Yay. <laughs> Let's heal the world and have the world see clear without glasses or surgery. Uh, <laughs> so knowing that we have a lot of women, I have a woman question. So knowing that a lot of women that are at the summits for them, uh -huh. do you notice or have you noticed that there's different kind of internal work or different yes. kinds of patterns that women have to do versus men? Yes. Yes. Uh, well, on the one hand, uh, about 75 to 80% of my students are women. Like, mm -hmm. uh, well, this is probably a common trend in personal development and holistic healing. It's much more appealing to women and women are uh, more ready to grow uh, nowadays in these fields. And, uh, but not only mm, the bigger part of my students are women, but indeed there are differences in, in the development of symptoms. Um, for example, a presbyopia happens m sooner and more often for women than for men. And when you look at the emotional uh, meaning of presbyopia, you can understand why. So, Sorry, presbyopia is uh, this thing that you cannot read near and that you have to put yeah, things further away to see them and you need reading glasses. We are told that presbyopia appears with age and statistically it is correct, but it doesn't mean that it's a natural law or that's genetic and that it's a fatality that it has to be this way. Because probably we all know an old lady that is still able to put the thread in the needle even being 80 or 90 years old. So that means if they can do it, they don't need reading glasses. They have good vision even when they're old. And also it's very interesting and anthropology uh, tells us that, that there are countries where there is no or almost no presbyopia, even for old people. So it's not like a biological determination. It really depends on what's happening in the emotional level. And presbyopia appears for people when they start feeling useless. Uh, when the things more important in their lives already happened, like they already had kids or they already didn't have them or they got married or they got divorced, but whatever happened is already over. They bought the house or they didn't have, buy it or they had the career or they didn't have it. But like the most important things in life already happened. And uh, technology is going fast and they feel useless and then they're retired. So they lose a sense of self-worth. And uh, because they don't feel the star in their own film anymore, then they start paying attention and who, who are the new stars? And they start giving their energy to those people. So they start overtaking care of their parents or their children or their partner or their neighbors or the poor children in Africa or whatever, but they're giving energy to everyone but themselves. And that happens when they start feeling useless because society has that look on them. And in societies where elder people are regarded with respect and admiration and they're honored and they're thanked for the efforts they made, etc., like in Confucianist societies like in China, there is almost no presbyopia. Interesting. So it's something that happens at the individual level, but also that happens at the collective level. 
Right. And because women are often um, socialized, the social norms for women and men tend to be different in societies, and women are socialized to take care of others, right. and not right. to take care of them, but to take first care of others. So presbyopia happens faster, uh, sooner, and yeah, and for more women. So this is a very strong message for women, especially after a certain age. Okay, you taken care of everyone. Now it's your turn. It's time to take care of your own dreams, of uh, your passions, whatever you want to do. And so uh, to be able to see clear again near you, you have to bring the energy to yourself right. and uh, use, um, what do you call that? Um, positive selfishness. You go first, then you. After that, you. And if there is something left, for you <laughs> okay <laughs> i love it yeah yes so that's the that's the the recipe that's how we call it the the, yeah. the prescription from the doctor <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and um so it's very important uh, for women who have developed presbyopia to be certain that they make uh, that they let the rest of their life be the best of their life mm -hmm. if you're still alive now then there's a meaning for you being there. So you have to make the most out of your life. And whatever happened in the past, okay, great. Give yourself congratulations. You can give yourself a medal, but then it's over, it's done. And now there's an ever going now. You should use yeah. the now in a way that's nice for you and make the now and the future exciting. And that's very, very, very important for, for women to give, uh, yeah, to bring their energy back to themselves. Yeah. Unbelievable. Well, <laughs> that is so, so true. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Wonderful. yeah, when they do it, they're absolutely excited and happy. And as I say, seeing better is just the, the cherry at the top of the cake because all their life becomes more exciting. And it's so empowering to see women, especially after a certain age, when they yeah. thought they couldn't see anymore and their health is falling to pieces and that they realize that they... Uh, that they can do something that they thought it was impossible. It's so empowering. Then then they own this power and they bring it to other parts of their life. And they start feeling able and uh, yeah, to do other things. Maybe they thought impossible or they didn't consider doing it, uh, but they have regained their power. And that's, that's absolutely beautiful. And that it doesn't have to follow that cultural norm of a certain nope. age, what's nope. happening to them or anything that they can go up. Into the exactly. Country flying in their life yeah they can be the white swan instead of being the ugly duck <laughs> <laughs> yes mm -hmm. wow i am so excited i can't wait till you get your program in english <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> so let's see so how they're gonna find you do you want to so shall i write it somewhere let's see it will be on here okay it'll be listed below when we give ours but i want to spell it out loud so it's www let me make oh. sure i get it right V O L V E R A V E R Claro C L A R O dot com. Exactly, which in and Spanish what stands for? Excuse me. What it's, does it stand for? It stands for seeing clear again, or to see clear again, or regain eyesight, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I don't know. Anything else you'd like that we talk about? Shall I give a little tip or something for people? Of course. Let me of know. course. Yeah. Oh. Just Yes. Okay, well, um, a couple of things that don't take time and they're very useful to take good care of your eyes. Blinking. Mm. It, it's free and it's ecological. <laughs> you don't have to pay for it. So blinking is so important. We should blink every two seconds and we actually oh, wow. don't do it. Yes, I recommend for people to do this exercise. Try these three things. First, um, try to be one minute without blinking. After that, actually, probably you will stop after 20 seconds because the eyes get so irritated and dry and it's really uncomfortable. And then you realize um, what wrong you're doing to your eyes when you don't blink enough. Then a second exercise is to well, be with someone or be looking at the mirror and count how many times you blink in a minute. And then the third exercise, you can put uh, some telephone that has some application with um, uh, um, 
well, with a timer or something, or, you know, the musicians, they have something called like metronome. metronome. Or something. Exactly. So something that tells you every two seconds so that you make sure that you blink every two seconds and you can compare the state of your eyes in those three situations. And probably you're going to want to choose to blink every two seconds because yeah. the comfort you're going to feel is much, much better. There's many, many uh, um, positive properties in blinking and it's an easy thing. You don't need to stop your life or to yeah, plan an hour every day so that you can blink. No, you just be aware of it and then you do it all the time and that's it. The electronics stop us from today. Do we just stare at the electronics and is that what happens? Exactly. One of the, one of the uh, harms of uh, screens to our eyesight is that we tend to look them like this and we stop yeah. blinking. And then we hear that there's, okay, that there, the reason why our eyes don't work is because of blue light and this and that. And that's part of the process too. But also that we train our eyes to have bad habits when we're in front of screens and not blinking is one of them. Another bad habit that we have nowadays is that we almost never look at the far. And that's right. extremely tiring for your eyes. Um, the um, uh, default resting position for eyes is looking at the far. That's when all the muscles are relaxed. Okay. And we spend more and more time looking near. Uh, uh, smartphones and tablets and computers. Looks, or we're driving and we have uh, the window that's already there. Or we're reading books. Or we're at home and we don't even look the, the farthest uh, part of the room. So that's extremely tiring for our eyes. It's as if we were through life always wearing weights and we would never let them go. So it's very important to look at the far. Um, another thing also, we spend very little time in the sunlight and the retina needs sunlight to be stimulated and to be nourished. Even when we go in the car, we have air conditioning and we have the, 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 the windows closed and right. many people even put something to filter the sun. Yes. So we never get either to look at the far, like put the window down so that you can look at the far and we never get any sunlight. And this is extremely terrible for eyes. So one thing that we can do that's very simple, at least once a day for a few minutes, you start noticing the difference even if you do it for one minute, ideally you can do it five to 10 minutes, something like that, is to go out in the sun, someplace where there's sun and with your eyes closed, this is very important, with your eyes closed, look at the sun and move your head very gently and let the sun stimulate your retina. You're going to feel all the relaxation in your eyes, the well-being in your body. And if you take a page with different sizes of letters and you look at it before doing the sunning and after doing the sunning, you're going to see that you see better the smaller print. It's immediate, just with a few minutes, you'll notice the difference. So there you go, three different uh, tips to improve your vision and take good care of your eyes. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> hey, that'll hold me over till you get your um, till you get it in English. So, yes, <laughs> or somebody to take it, to share it in Spanish with. So. Okay, as soon as it's available in English, you yeah. will know it, of course. And uh, yeah, I'll let you know also when uh, when the next uh, the next time that the Spanish one opens. Maybe there's people that you know that are interested, of course. Yeah. Some of our listeners might absolutely do that. So get on. I know his website, sign up for, so that you hear about when the English one comes out and that you get her tips that she's going to be sending to you. Thank you so much, Linda. It it's has been great. amazing to have this conversation with you. Very beautiful. And thanks again for the work you do. Yeah, and I'm just so pleased to help get your message out in the world. So thank you. Thank you. It's beautiful. <laughs> thank you, and everyone. Thank you and success for the whole summit and for every healer that she heals. <laughs>